right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Take a Virtual Hike on the Prairie with Bruce Schutte. My name is Emily Gustafson with the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and I want to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar today. During the video presentation, if you have questions, uh, please only put them in the Q&A section um, on your screen, and at the end, I will read those out to Bruce. This webinar is being recorded, and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. So now for some background on Bruce. Bruce Schutte retired from 36 years as park naturalist at Quiver River State Park, where he was involved in natural resource management, prescribed burns, invasive plant control, ecosystem management, as well as natural resource inventory, collections, monitoring, working with researchers, and nature education. He has served on the MPF board since January 2000 and has served as secretary from 2005 to 2012 and is currently Vice President of Science and Management and Chairman of the Science and Management Committee. We are really excited to have Bruce here today to show us around the prairie and share his prairie knowledge with us. I want you to note that this video is pre-recorded, but Bruce will be live with us after the presentation to answer your questions. And so now, Let's take a virtual hike with Bruce on Golden Prairie. Good day, everybody. And uh, today we're out here in uh, at Golden Prairie. Uh, this is one of the Missouri Prairie Foundation's oldest prairies, actually the second one that was purchased by the, the Prairie Foundation back in 1970. Uh, Golden Prairie is a, a really nice a remnant of our tall grass prairie. Um, in fact, it's so nice that back in 1975, uh, this Part of the prairie was designated by the National Park Service as a national natural landmark. That's what this little monument here on the prairie is. And that just signifies that it's uh, been found to be uh, a wonderful example of the country's national heritage as an example of, our, of the tall grass prairie here in Missouri. This part of the prairie was also more recently recognized as a Missouri State Natural Area. Uh, the natural area system in Missouri protects uh, some of the best remaining examples of Missouri's different types of natural communities. Uh, in this case, uh, the dry mesic sandstone shale prairie, that's what makes up most of uh, Golden Prairie. And so this is a very high quality example of this natural community and has been designated as a state natural area. So uh, those are among the things that show how special Golden Prairie is. It's really uh, a magnificent piece of what our natural heritage is um, here in just a few miles from Golden City. Um, so the Missouri Prairie Foundation has had this prairie since 1970 when we acquired most of the remnant prairie with a little bit more being added on in 1974 and then subsequently in the early 2000s we added a couple other uh, adjacent or nearby pieces that have since been either uh, they were cropland it was since been either reconstructed to prairie or uh, some degraded prairie, but they also help kind of expand the prairie footprint right here in this vicinity. So this prairie, um, I guess, is uh, protected now largely because of the efforts of a gentleman named Lowell Pugh. And Lowell grew up in nearby um, Golden City and lived here, I think, 
basically all his life, and his family actually owned this prairie for a considerable amount of time. They bought this prairie and some additional land back in the 1920s, and they owned it until um, it was until they sold it to the Prairie Foundation in 1970, at least this portion of it. And so Lowell was really a champion for prairies here in southwestern Missouri. Uh, he was well known. He was very instrumental in the Prairie Foundation uh, early efforts and um, just uh, a very ardent supporter of prairies and prairie protection and this prairie is one magnificent um, uh, kind of uh, memorial to uh, Lowell's uh, work and efforts all over all those many years. Okay, here's a, a real characteristic uh, prairie animal we have here. This is an ornate box turtle. Um, it's one of two kinds of box turtles you find in Missouri. The other one being the three-toed box turtle that is really more common and uh, especially all through the state and lives more typically in, in wooded areas where the ornate box turtle is much more common in uh, western Missouri and is much more of a grassland animal and very characteristic of our prairies. Um, the ornate box turtle tends to be a little bit smaller than the three-toed box turtle and also is pretty easy to, to tell uh, because when you look at the top part of the shell, the carapace, um, it tends to be kind of a little bit flattened on top, but especially characteristic is its darker color with each scoot having uh, yellow radiating lines on it and then a very definite yellow line uh, right along the middle of its back. And then when you look at the underside of the shell, again, you can see it has that same basic kind of pattern, a fairly dark brown with the yellow radiating lines on, on it, uh, much more so than the, the three-toed box turtle. So it's an easy turtle to tell, and again, one very characteristic of our, our prairies, uh, and so it's an important animal to have here. This one is also uh, apparently more of a predator on insects than the three-toed box turtle is. Uh, but just like the three-toed box turtle, on the underside of the shell, there is a hinge um, that they can, it gives them flexibility to close up the, the front half and the back half of the shell. And when they pull their head and feet inside, this gives them a, a large measure of protection against uh, pretty much all the other uh, critters that are out here. So we'll put our ornate friend down and This is uh, uh, one of our milkweeds. Uh, there's a number of milkweeds out here on the prairie, native milkweeds. Uh, this is one of them, typically called spider milkweed. Um, it's a fairly low growing one, but it has uh, these very large flowers. So it's uh, very attractive and uh, a very easy one to tell out here on the prairie. Uh, you can also see that uh, right now the the milkweed uh, flowers have lots of insect visitors. There's a number of ants on it and some very small little um, weevils. One of the groups of beetles, one of many groups of beetles, and I think one of the larger groups of animals in the world are the weevils. Um, and so one of their representatives is um, making its home on this spider milkweed right now. This over here is a dick sissle calling. Um, dick sissles are one of the, probably the most abundant grassland bird we have here in Missouri. Um, they do need open grasslands. Uh, they're only here during the summer. During the winter, they actually uh, go down to northern South America to spend the winter, but they come back in the spring, and uh, they're abundant on our prairies as well as other open grasslands. Uh, they've got that very unique kind of call, um, and 
so this is um this is one of our most common sounds out on the prairie and if you visit pretty much any of the prairies during the summer you're like to, likely to hear dick sussels uh calling frequently and and pretty much all over the place Um, so here we have several of our typical prairie plants, and one of the things you have to remember is um, anytime you visit a prairie, and especially now, but anytime you visit a prairie, you're going to see uh, just kind of a subset of what's out here that's actually in flower. So you will see some things in flower, but you'll see some things that had already flowered in the past and are now uh going to seed uh, you'll see things that have not yet flowered that will be flowering later on so uh, it'll, it's kind of a constantly changing landscape as the, the growing season progresses uh, right here um, we have a plant that uh, isn't blooming yet this is one of the tick seed or this is one of the tick tree foils, uh, the genus Desmodium. Uh, this one, because it doesn't have a stalk um, for the, the leaves coming off the stem. And so this is a, a typical prairie plant, the sessile leafed tick tree foil. And right over here is one of the prairie stalwarts, uh, pale purple cone flowers. They're starting to get fairly close. You can see the little rays starting to stick up, uh, but we're still a little ways from them um, actually coming into to bloom. But uh, these are one of the, the really beautiful, um, iconic uh, prairie wildflowers. And also one, of course, is a symbol for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And then right here is one of them that is already in flower. Of course, since it's flowering now, if you come back later this summer, uh, you won't see it in flower. But this is the prairie larkspur. Uh, it's a delphinium, so it's related to the delphiniums that um, are ornamentals, but this is a um, high-quality prairie plant. Um, it's a remnant-dependent species. This and the coneflower are remnant-dependent species, so uh, these you won't find too many places uh, that have been disturbed. Usually when you find these, it's on a good remnant prairie. Here's a nice patch of um, some of the some of the flowers. There is um, this one here, which is a uh, wild quinine or feverfew. Uh, this looks like it's the hispid one, which is a pretty good remnant dependent species. Um, this is a plant that I believe, with its common name, that is had been used medicinally in the past, um, and you can see it is actually in flower now. You can see the individual little flowers op opening up in, in that head. And then uh, along with that, we have uh, some goat's rue. Uh, this one hasn't opened yet. It should be opening pretty soon. Uh, when it flowers, it's a legume-type flower, a pea-type flower that is a two-tone, kind of a yellowish and pink, a real pretty two-tone flower when this one opens. And then there are, are some other uh, things in here like the, the prairie larkspur. kind of hard to tell because of its um, uh, green color uh, is the green milkweed. This one right here is um, Asclepius viridiflora and uh, so when these open up they'll stay a uh, green color so it's not in flower yet but uh, it will be green when uh, when the flowers do open up and this is a uh, this one is a good remnant dependent species so this is one you're not likely to see in uh, other areas outside of good remnant prairies or similar uh, native grassland habitats this open kind of somewhat open patch right here um, is mostly filled up by a plant called wood betony or lousewort uh, this one right here 
and it's past flowering. It does have a, a interesting kind of pale yellow flower uh, that's got a really kind of hook top to it. Uh, but the flowers are a little bit past now. But this plant is a partial parasite. Uh, it is still green and it can produce uh, some of its own food, but it also will tap into other plants and uh, um, remove some of the nutrients in that from other plants. And it's thought that that will then kind of weaken the other plants. And so you oftentimes where you find the wood bet near lousewort growing in a big group like this, uh, you'll find the other vegetation fairly sparse. Uh, probably as a result of the, the wood betony extracting some of their, their nutrients is a little bit of a competitive advantage. We're uh, kind of down in a little swale here, which swales are basically kind of drainage ways through a prairie, through an upland prairie uh, that will carry water um, at times, but they also will dry up. They're not permanent streams, but uh, they do kind of ch uh, kind of channel the moisture. And so, um, so typically uh, down in a swale, uh, you will find plants that are a little more moisture loving than up on uh, the higher parts of the prairie. Uh, so in some cases, that can be some different species that. Uh, need uh, or prefer the the little bit moister conditions um, several things that we have here right now one is the Ohio spiderwort uh, real pretty uh, bright blue flower uh, three petaled flower and then we also have here uh, beard tongue one of the beer tongues. Now these species are not particularly, they're not remnant dependent species, so they are found more widely, but uh, they are oftentimes found around um, swales and, and that. So this is the one beard tongue. And then um, we also have the, the leaves here from uh, water hemlock, which uh, will be coming up later on. This is a native plant, but it is one of the, the plants that is very poisonous to eat. Um, so kind of as the, the name implies, water hemlock is one that is, um, is not edible as, because it is a poisonous plant. Uh, so you really have to be be careful and the people the Native Americans and that that lived out on the prairies obviously had to know all these kinds of things about uh, what plants were edible what plants they could use medicinally and also very importantly what plants like this one that uh, you had to avoid Uh, kind of a spring favorite for many people on our prairies are is a um, Indian paintbrush and uh, this is a nice little patch it's probably getting towards the end of its blooming period so um, so they're getting a, a little bit um, past their peak but they're still really nice um, interesting thing with the Indian paintbrush is the red that you see uh, are not actually like petals or that. Uh, the flower is the little green thing in the middle and the red are bracts or modified leaves that surround where the flower is. So um, so it's a, a beautiful flower even though uh, what we're generally admiring is, is uh, the modified leaves and not really the, the flower itself. Uh, Indian paintbrush is also one that is um, uh, hemiparasitic or partially parasitic on other plants. Um, so this one, uh, like with the wood betony, is, um, is a hemiparasite. I'm not sure if they affect other plants very much, but they, um, uh, but they are helped by other plants. And while most of the Indian paintbrush on our prairies um, has the, the bracts that give it that red color, you do occasionally get um, ones that the bracts are yellow, like on this one here, uh, which is just a really pretty um, uh, version of it.
the blue indigo we have here is um, one of three different species of wild indigos that are found on this prairie. Uh, there's this blue one, which is a good remnant dependent species, um, has these beautiful uh, blue flowers on it that, that stick up um, from the, the main part of the plant. Uh, then we also have the cream wild indigo, which we may see later. And then uh, the white indigo is more of a summer uh, wildflower, but it's it's out here too. Uh, I believe all the indigos were ones that uh, the roots were used to make like a, a blue color dye uh, in, um, in historic, for historical uses and, and that. Uh, so this is um, uh, just one of the real pretty ones that uh, we find out here and, and especially kind of unique to some of the prairies down here in the southern, more southern part of the state. not flowering until in the fall so this one will be quite a ways off but right here is a downy gentian and downy gentians are one of the really remnant dependent species um, on the 0 to 10 scale that is um, uh, usually used this one I believe is a nine so it is a really remnant dependent species uh, in the flowers or, excuse me, in the fall, it will flower, and uh, the flowers are just a beautiful deep blue, a really pretty um, flower that you can find out here, and one of the, what tends to be one of the later blooming uh, nice wildflowers out on the prairie. Um, prairies uh, evolved with fire for thousands of years. Fires started mostly by Native Americans would sweep across the landscapes and kept our prairies um, as open grasslands. And so today, in order to keep our, to manage our prairies and keep them as prairies, we have to use prescribed burns, carefully controlled uh, burns that will mimic those fires and uh, keep the prairies as uh, the nice open grasslands we, we still enjoy. Um, over here is the area that was burnt this year. And on the other side then, we'll see the area that wasn't burnt this year. And you can see there's the dead plant material from last year. And so as a result, um, you get, tend to get more things flowering more profusely in the burned area as it opens it up and more sunlight reaches the ground and warms the ground and gets uh, probably gets the microbes going and you tend to get um, much more flowering activity in the part that was burnt. Uh, so with the, with doing the burns, uh, like I say, these are carefully controlled prescribed burns uh, done by our uh, director of prairie management, Jared Hubner, who is in charge of all of our uh, management activities on MPF prairies. But there are some important aspects that go into to doing the burns, and in recent years, one aspect that's uh, become uh, pretty important is the timing of the burns. Uh, this area was burnt I believe in February of this year and uh, Jared has been able to in recent years get, get all of our burns done before the end of February uh, while it's still well in the dormant season and ecologically this is considered really important. Um, as time has gone on ecologists uh, have looked into the effect of uh, timing on the response and it appears that uh, burning too late in the spring uh, tends to favor perhaps more weedy species and tends to favor more of the woody or brushy species which are another concern with management of the prairies uh, things like sumac which is part of the prairie system and it's something that uh, don't want to totally eliminate but it can also really take over and begin to dominate the grassland so it seems that uh, late burns into the later spring uh, tend to maybe even favor that uh, brushy component taking over versus burning in the dormant season and uh, 
um, fall and winter when um, it won't have uh, that much effect. So um, a lot of things go into taking care of our prairies. Uh, fire management is one big part of it. And you'll see that we don't burn all of our prairies in a given year uh, because there are some effects it can have on things like overwintering insects and things like that. So we burn between about a third up to maybe half of our prairies at the most uh, in a given year. And then we rotate that back around but we don't burn a whole prairie uh, in one given year to accommodate for the the insects and um, other animals that are that are dependent on on the the cover that the uh, grasses and that provide here's a, a few other um, prairie flowers that uh, this one can sometimes dominate some prairies. It's called Samson snake root. It's a little thing in the legume family and uh, on some prairies this will fall, this will just be one of the primary ground covers all through the prairie. Uh, the bright yellow here is one of the golden alexanders which is a thing that's in the carrot family called the umbelaceae. Uh, an umbel is where uh, you get a number of points coming out, almost like uh, spokes on a wheel or, or uh, rays on an umbrella, uh, kind of sticking out from one point. So uh, this is Golden Alexanders. And then right over here, uh, again, coming up a little bit later, is uh, Rosinweed, which is uh, one of the... Um, tends to be one of the taller wildflowers and it gets a big white, a big yellow flower, um, uh, like basically a sunflower and it's part of the sunflower family and it's, so it'll get this big yellow like sunflower looking flower um, later on during the summer. Uh, coming out about the middle of summer uh, in profusion will be this one. This is uh, the prairie blazing star, uh, sometimes called gay feather, liatris pycnostasia, um, and it can be quite abundant here. Uh, again, it's a midsummer blooming flower, so by midsummer the plant will be bigger and the top of the stem will be just a stalk of bright purple flowers. It's a beautiful plant and can oftentimes grow in quite thick patches. In fact, on the MPF website, I believe for this prairie, it shows just almost a solid like wall of um, the prairie blazing star with one bright yellow ashy sunflower and a little bit of rattlesnake master. Uh, that was taken just right up this the slope here a little bit. I believe it also made the cover of one of the prairie journals a few years ago. So uh, that was taken right here. That's this plant uh, just a little bit later on during the summer. Uh, also a little bit later this summer down closer to the ground here these uh, leaves that are kind of distinct looking and actually are kind of thick and leathery feeling. Uh, this is from Prairie Indian Plantain. Um, again, it'll bloom later in the summer, a real distinctive looking plant, uh, but it has this very interesting foliage and it also is another remnant dependent species. And then uh, in the foreground is this one. Um, a common name for it is uh, potato dandelion. It does have a structure that looks similar to a dandelion, but, um, but it's in a group of uh, native plants. The group is usually referred to as dwarf dandelions, and this one in particular is called potato dandelion. Um, it's a, it's a good prairie species, but um, it shows how there's constantly new discoveries to be made out here on the prairie. Um, this prairie currently has a species list of 329 native species. On the 320 acre remnant that makes up Golden Prairie, there's 329 uh, native species that we have recorded here, have been recorded here by botanists and, and that um, in the uh, length of time that MPF has 
own this prairie. This one was not on the list until today. Uh, so it shows how interesting it is to look at the prairies, uh, make trips out and explore them, and there's constantly new discoveries to be made, even uh, on our some of our prairies that have had uh, a number of people by here looking at plants, a number of botanists, but um, you have to be at the right spot at the right time. It helps if it was a portion that was burnt, uh, things like that, and so um, there's new discoveries still to be made out on our prairies, uh, like our potato dandelion here. Right here is another little cluster of uh, uh, different plants that will be blooming in uh, the near future. Um, this is uh, now called uh, prairie milkweed. It's one of the milkweeds out here. It used to be called tall green milkweed, but uh, now a lot of the books call it prairie milkweed. Uh, so this one, uh, these will open up and they will be green flowers again. So that's the, the milkweed. And then uh, right in front of the milkweed, uh, just the, the shoots from um, what will be the white prairie clover. White and uh, purple prairie clover is out here too, but the prairie clovers are really good remnant dependent species that score like an 8 on that 0 to 10 scale. And so this is white prairie clover, and then right back here is a plant that oftentimes is fairly dominant on prairies. This is uh, ashy sunflower or downy sunflower. So this will again get a, a nice sunflower looking flower um, come about the middle of summer. And then right over here is one of the violets you can find out on the prairie. This one is Viola sagittata. Um, the sagittata, I think maybe it's called the lance leaf uh, violet. And this is uh, one of several violets that's out here. And this is one of the species that's used by a rare butterfly. Um, the regal fritillary is a um, uh, kind of an icon of uh, prairies in that it's um, uh, really a butterfly that is remnant dependent. It has to have remnant prairies basically because it's food. These violets grow in remnant prairies and um, it's um, become quite rare. Some of our prairies down here in southwest Missouri are some of the last uh, really good strongholds for them, but um, the regal fritillary butterfly then needs these violets for a food source for their larvae. And while the butterflies uh, haven't showed up yet, I don't think for this year, uh, hopefully they'll be showing up pretty soon. But uh, you have to have these violets if you're going to have the, the regal fritillaries. And the regal fritillary isn't the only rare, uh, rare species we have here on the prairies. Uh, there's one uh, state listed rare plant species, but then uh, we have several uh, animal species. The regal fritillary is one of our rare species. Um, another one is um, the northern crayfish frog, a frog that uh, lives in, typically lives in crayfish holes uh, out here in the prairie. And then the northern, and uh, then the um, um, prairie mole cricket has also been recorded from this prairie. So those are all animals that have been recorded uh, from this prairie in recent years. And there's one more we'll be talking about in a few minutes. There's another nice, really nice grouping of uh, some different species right in here. Um, first of all, we can see some cream wild indigo, which this is uh, related to the blue indigo. Uh, but on this one, the flowers are kind of a pale yellow and they droop down. They kind of arch over towards the ground instead of sticking up. Uh, from the middle of the plant. Also, the plant tends to be kind of a, have kind of a fuzziness to it. Right behind that is uh, another one of the real icons of the tall grass prairie. This is lead plant. Um, will be flowering fairly soon. A little spike at the 
ends of the branches uh, covered with small little deep purple flowers with like golden colored anthers. Um, real pretty when it's in flower. Uh, this again is one of the really classic uh, remnant dependent species. So is the cream wild indigo. And um, this one um, is noted for having a um, very deep root system. I've heard that it was called prairie shoestring because um, um, the roots would stick down. They'd be so hard for people to plow through. And then when they'd break through, there'd be almost kind of a twang or, or something. Um, so this was uh, one of the, the real stalwarts of the tall grass prairie. Uh, mixed right in with it is prairie phlox. So this is uh, one of the real showy species. Uh, it's kind of coming to the end of its blooming period now, but this one is still in, in real nice shape. And then as we move right over here, we have another remnant dependent species. This one is called New Jersey tea. Um, it actually forms kind of a little shrub like lead plant. It's actually considered kind of a very low but a woody plant. Uh, this one will form kind of a little shrub. Um, early in the summer it gets clusters of white flowers on it. It's very pretty. Uh, but it's called New Jersey tea and it was also this plant was used as a, as a tea. Um, and even in early colonial days, they made a tea out of uh, New Jersey tea. And I had heard that um, in the early days, um, like during revolutionary period, after uh, tea supplies were cut off, like after the Boston Tea Party, that this would have been one of the um, plants that the colonists used to make tea when uh, the the tea the imported tea supplies were were cut off. So this is New Jersey tea found um, here on many of our prairies. Another really interesting uh, of the sort of classic prairie plants is rattlesnake master. Um, which is actually a member of the carrot family. So it's related to uh, like the golden Alexanders we saw before or it's related to, to carrots. But um, its scientific name for the species is yucca folium because on these kind of succulent sort of sword-like leaves there are little projections sticking out that kind of remind you of uh, a yucca and so it's called, its scientific name reflects that as like yucca foliage. Um, so this is rattlesnake master. When it does flower, it's just a little sort of spherical cluster of little kind of white or uh, pale greenish um, flowers. But it turns out to be very interesting in a number of different ways. It is a, a really good plant for pollinators. Um, the plant is kind of fibrous and historically uh, Native Americans used to use the fibers uh, for making things including things like sandals. So uh, there have actually been in archaeologic excavations um, sandals found that were made from rattlesnake master, the kind of cordage you can make from rattlesnake master. And in the last couple of years, it's also been known to support a couple new species to Missouri, including one called a rattlesnake master stem borer, which is a um, uh, very rare species. Uh, at first, it was known from Illinois and then just uh, a few other spots and it wasn't even known from Missouri until just a few years ago when a guy named Jim Weicker from Illinois came over here and studied um, Rattlesnake Master and found the Rattlesnake Master stem borer at um, a number of sites in Missouri including this one. So um, this prairie is host to the Rattlesnake Master stem borer that relies on rattlesnake master and nothing else uh, and is an, another one of the rare species that um, that is found here. So rattlesnake master a very interesting plant and also one of the remnant dependent plants and then here we actually have one of our grasses that's um, um, either flowering or uh, just about in flowering um, 
shape and uh, this is June grass. And June grass is a little bit different than many of the prairie grasses we normally think of like big blue stem and little blue stem. Uh, most of these other grasses which are warm season grasses and so they put on most of their growth uh, during the middle of the summer. The hot dry part of the summer is when these grasses really take off and grow and give us the tall grass prairie. But the tall grass prairie has a lot more intricacies than that. And besides those few main tall grasses, there's many other grasses um, that are found out here. And one of them is this June grass, which is a cool season grass. It grows, does most of its growth uh, more like now um, before the warm season grasses really take off. So uh, this one will we're seeing clumps of it kind of scattered around all over the prairie right now. You want to step pretty lightly around this really pretty uh, flower on the prairie. This is sensitive briar or cat claw sensitive briar, um, which uh, seems uh, kind of at odd, sensitive briar and cat claw, but the, the leaves are sensitive and uh, when they're open and you touch them they'll kind of close up but when you look at that stem it has got wicked thorns on it but the flower is absolutely gorgeous and in fact uh, the genus now is mimosa and you can see the resemblance to like the flowers on a mimosa tree uh, but so the sensitive briar is common out on our prairies and a uh, beautiful plant, uh, very interesting plant, but you do need to kind of be careful and dress appropriately walking through the prairie because you do find the sensitive briar out here with these stems with all those thorns on them. Prairie parsley is this, uh, again, a member of the uh, carrot family uh, that is common out on prairies. Uh, in fact, in this case, you can see a bee that's uh, working over it collecting pollen. So um, obviously good for some pollinating insects. Uh, but the prairie parsley is uh, another one of our, what we call remnant dependent species. And just very quickly, um, that's a way that botanists and ecologists have of kind of ranking plants from zero to 10 on how sort of faithful they are to a remnant natural community. In other words, how remnant dependent they are. So species with low scores like this daisy fleabane, uh, I think it's a three. And so species with a low score like that, uh, they're native species, they belong out here, but they don't tell you that this has always been a prairie. They're, um, you know, they can be found in other more disturbed areas. So they're part of the system, but they don't tell you about it. Um, and then we move up when we have scores of like four, fives, and sixes. That's what kind of the majority of the plants out here that really make up the prairie community are in that group. Uh, they're oftentimes referred to as like matrix species um, and that can include like the the prairie larkspur and um, many of the prairies that many of the plants that we've talked about um, on this hike but then we come to the ones that we call ecologically conservative are the really prayer the really remnant dependent species these are the species that on that ranking are generally like seven eights nines and tens and those are species that just um, can't um, be found really in a system that's been altered significantly so when you find find those, uh, this prairie parsley, the pale purple cone flowers, the white prairie clover, there's lead plant right over there. When you find all these kind of species, uh, especially this close together and all sort of intermixed, that tells you that this is a good remnant 
uh, a good example of a remnant community that has all these plants that wouldn't be here otherwise. Uh, this particular prairie out of the 329 now species that are found on it, uh, about 35 are these remnant dependent species. And so that's a good number. And again, those are the kind of things that we look for to know that we have a good remnant prairie like here at Golden Prairie. And here's another rare treat. Uh, this is prairie hyacinth. Um, related to the more common wild hyacinth, but this one is much more of a remnant dependent species. And in fact, at one point, I think it was even considered a rare species in Missouri. It's enough populations have been found. It's not considered rare right now, but um, it certainly is a very uncommon species and, uh, and uh, a nice treat to find. Um, this one is uh, flowers later, so the wild hyacinth, the more common one, is already done flowering and is going to seed, but this one is kind of right at the peak of its flowering right now. Okay, well thanks for <clears throat> coming on our hike through Golden Prairie. Hope you enjoyed taking a look at this wonderful example of a, of a tall grass prairie natural community that's uh, protected and uh, managed by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And we thank many of you for your support over the years. Um, your support of the Prairie Foundation is what makes it possible to acquire uh, and protect in perpetuity uh, examples of our tall grass prairie like this and uh, to, to take care of them uh, and then also to help uh, educate others about the importance of protecting our tall grass prairie remnants and grassland systems uh, overall. All right, thank you everyone. I am going to turn things over to Bruce just a moment and then we will get to your questions. Uh, but uh, first I'd like to uh, thank Emily for um, putting this video together. Uh, we'd been thinking for a while that it would be uh, kind of nice to do something as uh, like a live hike on the prairie or to do it as live as possible. Um, which is what we tried to do here. Uh, we just visited the prairie last Thursday. And so you kind of get to see firsthand how um, when you visit a prairie, not everything is going to be all in flower like you might see in a, a PowerPoint or, or something like that. Uh, we go through and all the things are at uh, various stages of their seasonal life cycle. But um, Emily did all the, the video filming, the editing, put together uh, this whole video. So uh, thank you. And we hope that you all have enjoyed taking this tour. And um, I guess one benefit for it being a virtual tour is you don't have to worry about checking for ticks now. So. Um, with that, I guess we'll try and, and answer some questions that you might have. Yeah, so we did have some great questions come in with the Q&A. Um, so the first question that I have is from Terry, um, who's visited Cedar Glades in Tennessee and said that uh, they've seen many of the same plants. Are these native prairies also limestone based? Actually, this particular, uh, well, it varies with the prairies. This particular prairie um, is considered to be a sandstone shale prairie, uh, which is, I believe, the most common type of prairie we have left in Missouri. But in Missouri, we do have uh, some limestone dolomite prairies 
And then we also have some chert prairies in that too. Um, so there are some plants that you would find um, on the limestone dolomite prairies that we don't have on a sandstone prairie like uh, Golden Prairie, but there are a lot of similarities. And then it's kind of the same thing with grasslands in general, where um, prairies, glades, and then even savannas and very open woodlands are all basically grassland systems. And again, they all have their different species associated with them, but there are also many species in common uh, for pretty much all the, the range of uh, grassland communities. Great, and a similar question um, that was asked was, would all or most of this info also apply to West Central Illinois? Um, and are there kind of major differences, say, between our prairies in Southwest Missouri and those that you might find in West Central Illinois? So the information and most of the species would probably be pretty much the same. Uh, there are going to be some differences because as we travel across the range of the tall grass prairie, which actually on the Western side starts out like in the Flint Hills of uh, Kansas. And as you move East, you get uh, increasing amounts of moisture. So the climate varies a little bit. Um, soil types can uh, vary in southwest Missouri. You won't get the glacial soils like you might have in, um, in much of Illinois. So there will be some differences, but again, there will still be a lot of similarities too. Great. Um, we also had someone who joined a little bit late ask whether Golden Prairie is has been seeded or planted? Um, has seeding ever been um, part of management at Golden Prairie? Um, the remnant part of Golden Prairie, the 320 acres, it's a remnant, it's a natural area, that's a national natural landmark. It has never been seeded with anything. It is a remnant. Everything has been growing there for presumably thousands of, thousands of years. Um, there are parts of it on the southeast part. Uh, we later acquired an area that was uh, a crop field and it's been planted with prairie species. And on the northwestern side, <clears throat> we acquired uh, a piece that has some uh, degraded prairie and some that I believe has been planted. But uh, the remnant part of Golden Prairie where we were, uh, none of that's been planted. It was. It's all there naturally. Great. Um, then another question, this is about management. Um, what months are considered winter months with respect to burning? Uh, I think basically sort of like the December, January, February. Um, so usually, all indications are that Native Americans started burning uh, like in Indian summer, like in October and November. And so that's kind of considered, I guess, more the fall. And then through the dormant season, the winter would be like December, January, and February. And ecologists now oftentimes think that it's best if the burns can be done before the like end of the winter, the end of the dormant season, which we generally consider to be about the end of, of February, especially in southwestern Missouri on the prairies. Great. And then we had another question that was just about what is the frequency um, with which we burn, um, typically burn our MPF prairies and maybe specifically Golden Prairie? Um, it will vary some, and of course, from year to year, it varies how much you can do because of weather conditions and that. Uh, but as I said, we never burn the whole thing at once. Uh, typically about a third to a half, sometimes maybe a quarter. So um, probably most parts of the prairie are going to get burnt uh, anywhere from every other year, every third year, um, usually in, in that frequency range. Okay, um, 
I can answer this question, um, which we were asked, what date was this recorded? Um, so Bruce and I were actually out on the prairie last Thursday morning. Um, so this is you know, less than a week ago out on Golden Prairie. Um, and then for additional, so we have a few questions about plants, about other plants and animals um, that you can find on Golden Prairie. I'm going to kind of collate those. So one is what other mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds are commonly found on Golden Prairie. Um, we were also asked, um, let's see, sorry, let me find the question again. Um, does Golden Prairie have prairie crayfish or grassland crayfish? Um, and then we also had a question of whether or what bumblebees are present um, on Golden Prairie or our prairies generally. Okay. Um, as for prairie crayfish, yes, they definitely are found on uh, Golden Prairie. Um, I got some pictures there a few years ago um, in an, on an evening hike. Uh, there was a female uh, grassland crayfish with young ones uh, tucked up under her abdomen. And uh, you'll see that in some pictures in the Prairie Journal, including I think a recent one on prairie crayfish. And so that those pictures were actually taken on Golden Prairie. So they definitely are there. Um, as to bumblebees, I'm not sure exactly on Golden Prairie. Um, we do try and keep track of that as we uh, get a chance. Um, we just recently had a pollinator survey done of three other prairies and they listed um, the different kinds of bumblebees they encountered as well as uh, all the other kinds of bees besides bumblebees, generally averaging about 50 species per prairie that they, they sampled with a few of those on each prairie being bumblebees. And then currently, um, one of our board members, Doug Helmers, uh, has been kind of heading up uh, bumblebee surveys, part of the uh, bumblebee atlas. And so he has been doing the surveys on some of our prairies. And so as um, he gets a chance to, to look at some of the different prairies, we'll get some of that information um, as to what specific bumblebees uh, he's been finding on those prairies. Other animals, um, you know, it can kind of vary uh, for birds besides dick sissels. Uh, Thursday morning, I was hearing Bell's vireos and eastern meadowlarks. Um, I know from the past that there's grasshopper and uh, Henslow sparrows that are there. Uh, let's see, and bobwhite quail are frequently found on the, the, the prairies. Uh, mammals, uh, I'm not sure. We do have a um, university researcher from Missouri State University that is looking at small mammals on a number of our prairies. And I did see a coyote um, while I was walking around Thursday morning. So that would be one of the, the larger animals as well as deer. Deer are very common on the prairies too. And then when it comes to reptiles, um, I'm not sure exactly on um, Golden Prairie specifically. I think um, Prairie King snakes, I believe, have been found there, even black rat snakes. I think maybe slender glass lizards, they have been found on a number of our prairies. Uh, bull snakes are occasionally found on a prairie, but again, I can't remember specifically on Golden Prairie. And Bruce, you actually did see another um, turtle on Golden Prairie on Thursday morning. You saw a snapping turtle in the swale. Is that correct? Yep, I uh, I did see a snapping turtle just kind of walking along out in the middle of the prairie, which is 
kind of surprising. However, um, they there are a couple small pawns on Golden Prairie where they certainly could be, as well as on the adjoining property. And even though snapping turtles don't leave the water very often, uh, females will leave the water to lay their eggs on land. Or sometimes I think if they just get kind of overcrowded, occasionally one will take off and go overland, uh, hoping to find another body of water. Probably sometimes they don't, but sometimes they do, and that can aid their dispersal. So Bruce, it is five o'clock. Are you okay spending a few more minutes answering a few questions from folks? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, so we do also have a couple of questions about plants on the prairie. So one of them uh, was, are prairie milkweed and green milkweed attractive to monarch butterflies? I believe so. Um, I think some milkweeds are much more attractive or much more commonly used, including, um, I believe, common milkweed. Um, is one of the, the principal ones, but I have seen monarch caterpillars on uh, the prairie milkweed. And I can't remember if I've ever seen them on green milkweed. I would think that they could be used, but um, also not being real common compared to something like the common milkweed or swamp milkweed. Um, it may just be that they're not used nearly as frequently because they're, they're much, much less common. Hey, um, have you ever tried the tea from the New Jersey tea leaves? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I have never tried that, but, um, but I've heard that it was um, a pretty commonly used, um, pretty, pretty common drink made from uh, a native wild plant uh, that that was, um, you know, one that was used quite a bit. And, and uh, sounds like came in useful, especially at certain times. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, and this is a question that I had, um, that is Jack asks, why can't remnant species be found on restored prairies? So for those plants that have that high C value, why is it, why do those indicate we're, we're on a remnant versus a, a restoration or another type of uh, habitat or plant community? You can uh, sometimes find them. If you get the seeds and you plant the seeds, um, I know some um, of the uh, remnant dependent species will still come up from seeds and will grow on uh, like reconstructions or plantings. Um, it's still not the same as on a remnant prairie uh, because those species um, on a remnant prairie are mixed in with all the soil microbes that we're still just at the infancy of trying to understand and, uh, you know, just all the intri intricacies of what go on uh, with, the, um, with the prairies and with, within a remnant prairie. Uh, but, you know, certain remnant dependent species can be grown from seed and can come up in, um, in a planting, but, you know, it's, it's great to have them, but it's still not like, uh, quite like the real thing. And I have heard that certain insects that are dependent on remnant dependent plants like um, pale purple cone flower, I believe, and, and some other ones, and um, even though the plants can be found maybe in a planting or reconstruction, those insects don't necessarily follow right along. So again, it may be, I, I don't think anybody knows yet, but whether or not there's something else about them that makes them still not as important for the, the insect as the ones growing out in a true remnant situation. Yeah, and this, that actually leads me to another question that someone had. They did not catch what the additional um, species was that was rare on Golden Prairie, in addition to the regal fritillary butterfly, the uh, northern crayfish frog, and the prairie mole cricket. 
and that was the rattlesnake stem borer, correct? Right. That's the that's the one that I mentioned we'd be seeing farther along. So that yeah. was it. And then um, I might also interject for just a minute. Um, we mentioned as we were going through that that potato dandelion was actually a new species for the list for Golden Prairie, um, which is one of those things that I still find amazing that um, even a prairie that's been protected for like 50 years now and has been looked over by many people and you can occasionally still find a, a new species. Well, that day, not only did we find one new species, the, the potato dandelion, we actually found a second new species also. And that was a prairie hyacinth that we mentioned right at the very end. Um, I didn't realize it until I got back and checked the list a little bit later, but it also was, that's a species that also had not previously been recorded on Golden Prairie. So uh, on this hike, we actually added two new species to what's known, and it's now up to like uh, 330 species on Golden Prairie. And so for like learning more about the species that you can find on Golden Prairie, particularly when we're talking about those really conservative species, is there a resource that people can look at to see what the C values are of different uh, plants in Missouri? Um, <clears throat> Overall, there is a, a publication by uh, Doug Ladd and Justin Thomas. I think it's called something like an ecological checklist of the flora of Missouri, something, something like that, and it has been published. I can't remember if that's available on our website, but for Golden Prairie in particular, um, we do have some surveys that have been done um, at Golden Prairie and our other prairies, and they are available on the MPF website. If you go to that particular prairie, uh, for example, with Golden Prairie, I think there may be one or more than one on birds. There may be one on, uh, there may be one on herps, and um, there will be at least one on uh, the floristic integrity of the, of the, um, Golden Prairie. And that's some sampling that was done by Justin Thomas and the Institute of Botanical Training. And while it's not a list of everything that's on the prairie, in the plots that he sampled, which is part of the part of the report, and it does go through, and I think it gives a list of all the plants um, identified in those plots, and it would give the C value of the, the plants that are listed in there. That's great. Um, there is another management question that came in and we talked about this, actually, this was not recorded, but we talked about it after um, we did the prairie tour on Thursday. And that was, has um, animal grazing or grazing animals, have those been used on Golden Prairie or have they been used as part of MPF's management strategy with our prairies? Um. <clears throat> I can't remember, I don't think on all or most of the remnant that we have used grazing animals there. Um, we did very briefly on a couple other prairies at just very low, very low rates, uh, but that was a number of years ago. So we haven't in, in recent years. Um, that's something that for a variety of reasons, we, we typically don't use grazing. And I think it's still, um, the jury's kind of out on um, how impactful uh, native grazers might have been on most of the prairies in Missouri. Okay. Um, so, and MPF uses a, you know, a number of different management strategies that do depend on the individual prairie, the individual property that, that we're talking about. Um, and you were also asked, what are some of those other types of prairies we have um, that are under management by MPF? So Golden Prairie is one type of prairie, but what else, what else could folks you know, see when they go you know, to where we work or they decide they want to visit one of our prairies? 
um, what are the what are the different types that that we have that are all open um, and uh, available to the public for use on foot, hiking, bird watching, etc. Right. I think um, on the, the web page under the where we work and the list of the prairies, when you click on a prairie, I believe it usually says what kind of prairie it is. Um, most of our prairies would be like golden prairie that are um, sandstone shale or uh, the other one it's probably most common would be considered chert prairies. And so that's what most of our prairies probably fall into one of those two types. However, we do have several other ones. Um, we do have um, uh, several limestone dolomite prairies, most notably um, La Petite Gem, Rock Hill Prairie, Shooty Prairie, uh, at least part of Snowball Hill and part of Stillwell prairie um, that are limestone dolomite prairies. Um, most of our prairies do have uh, swale communities, like we mentioned, kind of the low drainage ways, which are uh, a little bit different because or have a, a few other species in that because they tend to be moister. And then we also, in the last few years, have picked up several um, very unusual, very rare prairie types here in Missouri. Uh, a few years ago, um, donated to the Prairie Foundation was a Polson Lust Bluff Prairie in northwestern Missouri. Uh, it's, I think, our only site which isn't generally open to the public because it is on a very steep Lust Slope, uh, which is fragile and also could be dangerous. But that is uh, an example of that kind of um, rare prairie community. And then in southeastern Missouri, we've just recently acquired two tracks down there that have sand prairie. And sand prairie is um, a very restricted kind of prairie, mostly to southeast Missouri, very little bit in, in northeast Missouri, and is a very different kind of prairie community. So um, we have most all the prairie communities um, represented as um, examples on MPF land. And that's really great. And those new prairie acquisitions are really exciting. Um, and, you know, we look forward to seeing, especially with those sand prairies, how they develop with restoration and management efforts over the next several years. Um, so I'm gonna end this with one final question uh, from, from folks, which is, will, will we do another presentation like this? We had several questions about seeing the prairie at a different time of year, maybe later in the summer um, or early fall or doing a tour of another prairie. I don't wanna put you on the spot, Bruce. <laughs> um, but you know, this seemed to be something that, that folks are interested in knowing of whether we might do this again um, and be able to see maybe different plants and animals um, on Golden Prairie or maybe on another prairie. So that is, that's exciting. If you, if you are willing, we, <laughs> maybe this is- I like would certainly be willing. And um, I think that would be a great idea. Uh, like we said, this was, kind of an experiment to see how this would work. Uh, uh, and I know, Emily, you put in a lot of work in um, kind of researching how to do the video and sound out in the field and, and put everything together. And so it's probably if you would be willing to put in the time again to, to do it. But um, if people like this format, I would certainly think there's a, a good possibility that we could do this again. Right, because there are, you know, there are so many changes that happen in like on a prairie landscape, depending on the season, right? We're there, you know, at the end of May. In a couple of weeks, the prairie is going to look very different from what it looked like last mm -hmm. Thursday, let alone what it'll look like, you know, at the middle of August or at the end of September. Um, and what I would encourage folks to do 
is we have on our website, moprairie.org, where you can learn more about the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Um, and there is a link in that I put in the chat um, that was to where we work. And that lists all of um, our prairie properties, it includes information about those prairies, some of those surveys um, and I, your studies that have been done of the prairies are listed. I mean, you can read about those, read about the plant and animal species um, that have been found on our different remnants and also directions um, to visit those prairies uh, yourselves. And we do have prairies in different parts of the state. Many of them are in Southwest Missouri, but of course we have the sand prairies in Southeast. Um, we have several prairies in Pettis County, closer to central Missouri. Um, we have Snowball Hill that is very close to Kansas City. Um, so definitely take a look at moprairie.org, find out more information about us um, and about uh, where we work. And there is a nice Google map that you can search to see where, you know, what prairie might be, might be closest to you. Um, and all of our prairies are different, but each one of them is special and worth a visit. Um, so thank you so much, Bruce, um, for uh, your efforts and for giving this tour. And if we didn't get to your questions, um, I am sorry if I missed any, um, but the webinar uh, will be, it has been recorded and there will be an email sent to you all tomorrow with the webinar link and other helpful resources, including some of the things that Bruce has talked about in the Q&A. If you've enjoyed this presentation, um, we hope that you'll join us for our June 7th MPF Masterclass, where we'll learn all about hoverflies from entomologist Betsy Betros. And so that will be a really interesting, uh, that will be a really interesting discussion. So I hope that you all have a great evening and thank you again, Bruce, and thank you all uh, for joining us um, here uh, this evening. Thank you. Well, here.